everybody. Thank you very much for being here, especially to our witnesses. Thank you very much for um, being with us today and uh, participating. And I, I know it will be, I hope, a very fruitful discussion. Um, the purpose of today's hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, is to take a hard look at the current state of the Army Medical Action Plan. This will be the third hearing this subcommittee has held on the Army Medical Action Plan, the Army's response to the revelations at Walter Reed Army Medical Center last year, since it was issued in June 2007. When the Army Medical Action Plan execution order was issued last summer, the Military Personnel Subcommittee believed that the Army had finally demonstrated a full understanding and acceptance of the organizational and systemic shortcomings that had led to the scandalous conditions at Walter Reed. We felt that the Army Medical Action Plan was a comprehensive and ambitious blueprint to tackle these issues head on. After years of frustration, many on this subcommittee believed that the Army was finally ready to take the necessary steps to solve these problems. <clears throat> However, from our very first briefing on the Army Medical Action Plan, we had two significant concerns. The first was that the Army would be unable to initially dedicate and then maintain over the long haul the level of resources required by the Army Medical Action Plan. Specifically, we were worried that the Army would be unable to assign adequate numbers of personnel to the warrior transition units. Why? Because the core of the warrior transition units were to be the same soldiers that make up the backbone our brigade com of our brigade com combat teams, mid-grade non-commissioned officers. And these soldiers were already in short supply. The second concern was that Army commanders would overwhelm the warrior transition units by sending them all of their soldiers with medical issues, rather than just those with complex injuries or conditions that required comprehensive case management. In truth, we did not feel that this was necessarily a bad thing, especially if it helped units deploy at full strength while injured or ill soldiers had the opportunity to fully recover. Of course, this would only work if warrior transition units were properly resourced to take care of these soldiers. From June 2007 through February 2008, the members and staff of this subcommittee made numerous visits to warrior transition units throughout the Army. The overall trend we observed was positive. The Army Medical Action Plan was clearly providing better support for recovering soldiers than the previous medical whole medical holdover system. One wounded warrior commented, thank God for the warrior transition unit. Things are so much better than they were before. That was good to hear. But despite the positive trends, we were frustrated at the slow progress of implementing the AMAP. We felt that things should have and could have been moving faster. We also felt that there was a disconnect between how quickly the Army leadership believe things were happening and what the facts on the ground seem to indicate. Again, despite the challenges, we felt things were moving in an overall positive direction. However, our concerns about warrior transition unit staffing levels and the potential of line units, quote, dumping soldiers on the warrior transition unit continued. We asked General Schoomaker about this repeatedly during our hearing in February to get an update on the AMAP. In response to a question asked by Mr. McHugh, the Army Surgeon General declared, quote, for all intents and purposes, we are entirely staffed at the point we need to be staffed, unquote. As the facts at Fort Hood demonstrate, that is clearly not the case now. Gentlemen, the Army Medical Action Plan was designed by the Army. It is your plan. The Army senior leadership has publicly trumpeted your commitment to wounded soldiers at every opportunity, and we believe that that is true. But the Secretary of Defense agrees, as Dr. Gates has made clear, apart from the war itself, this department and I have no higher priority. Over the course of this hearing, we will review the following topics. Resources. Why has the Army failed to properly resource the warrior transition units? WT population growth. Why did the Army fail to predict the growth in the WT population? We were assured by the Army during our hearing in February that you had the processes and reviews in place to stay on top of the population. And clearly, that's not the case today. Priority. 
is the Army Medical Action Plan truly the Army's number two priority? Our visits do not leave us with that impression. And creativity. From the outset, the Army Medical Action Plan has been sold as a bold roadmap to overhaul outdated, inefficient, and detrimental policies and procedures. And in fact, when General Tucker was selected to lead this effort last year, he was introduced to us as the Army's premier bureaucracy buster, responsible for identifying outmoded practices and leading the effort to develop new, more effective ways of doing business. Many of the problems that continue to hinder warrior transition units seem to be an institu institutional insistence on doing things the old way. And oversight, finally and perhaps most importantly, why did it take oversight visits from the subcommittee to identify and spur the Army to fix these issues? And what will it take to ensure that the Army follows its own plan and lives up to its own promises? Gentlemen, aside from telling us you will work harder to implement, and we do believe that, uh, we, we know that you are working very hard at this, what concrete steps are being taken to ensure better follow through? I also want to mention that this subcommittee has worked very hard to make this an open and collaborative process. Our staff readily and routinely shares all of the information they collect at the warrior transition units they visit. This includes conducting an outbrief with a cadre, hospital, chain of command, and frequently representatives from the senior mission commander before <coughs> they leave an installation. They have also met regularly with the Surgeon General and the warrior transition office. There is nothing we have learned that we have not shared. There are no facts that we know and that you do not. So let me be clear that we understand that the Army Medical Action Plan remains a work in progress. We did not expect that it would immediately resolve all problems. None of us could have expected that. And we were certain that it would require modification and update along the way. However, we are very concerned that the Army took its eye off that ball, that you are not living up to the goals you set and the promises you made when the Army Medical Action Plan was issued. So we look forward to your testimony and to learn what steps you plan to take to ensure its success. We intend to make certain that our wounded warriors receive the care and the support they deserve by holding you to the standards you have yourselves set forth in the Army Medical Action Plan. I want to turn now to Mr. McHugh for his comments. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a rather extensive statement that I'm not going to read uh, in its entirety. I would ask uh, for its unanimous adoption of the record without objection. Uh, and, and let me just make a few comments. First of all, Madam Chair, let me express my appreciation to you. As you noted, this is the third open hearing we've had. Uh, both the Chair and other members and I have had the opportunity as well to visit warrior transition units at various facilities to meet with some of the command staff. And, and I think it's important to say at the outset that I certainly agreed at the time it, this, this approach was implemented that it's the correct path. And for all of the challenges that we have encountered, I continue to believe that the WTU concept is a very, very positive one responding to uh, a rather new dimension of challenge in terms of treating with, exp with respect and dignity and hopefully the greatest facility uh, these warriors who have given so much on behalf of their nation. And in no discussion I've had and no trip I've made, no visit I've uh, taken part in, have I in any way had cause to question any of the devotion or dedication that the Army and its personnel bring to this challenge. That having been said, as the chair lady, I think, very adequately and accurately outlined in her opening comments, there continues to be serious shortfalls, shortfalls that uh, our staff uh, did identify and that I know the Army continues to try to uh, deal with serious questions, that of resources. Of a mechanism that sufficiently anticipates the population growth that we have seen, an explosion in the cadre of these units and, and an expansion that we have every reasonable expectation will, will continue. 
the continued proliferation of rules and regulations, good old-fashioned bureaucracy that for all of the efforts and, and uh, I think successful attempts that have been made to identify them far too often continue to uh, frustrate those who are trying to do this uh, very important challenge and, and trying to ensure that we minimize the weights that are involved through, of course, the MEB process and, and on and on and on. This hearing, uh, I would say to our distinguished panelists, is an attempt to more fully discuss those challenges, those shortfalls, to try to get from you your perspective in a process by which we can all learn, <coughs> and hopefully uh, sooner and as quickly as possible, uh, begin to do the best job by these folks who have done such incredibly positive work for us. So I want to add my words of welcome to our distinguished panelists that I know that the chair will, will introduce here and uh, very much look forward to your testimony and hopefully to uh, taking part in a process that can uh, finally get this concept uh, off the paper and fully implemented in the way in which I know we all want to see it work. So General, uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you uh, very much and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. And I turn to General Rochelle. Uh, I believe that you're going to give the statement. Is that for everyone? Uh, Madam Chair, I believe uh, we each have a statement, each have an a oral statement, statement okay. but I would like to submit our joint written statement for the record uh, with your permission. Absolutely. Thank and you. if I may proceed with the uh, oral statement. Yes, please. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you very much, Representative McHugh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, subcommittee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss the status of the Army Medical Action Plan, in particular the Warrior Transition Units. Uh, I echo, first of all, the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary's call to the Army to ensure our warriors in transition and their families receive the care and support they require in environments most conducive to their healing. We have accomplished much, but we're not mission accomplished in this area. Our system of caring for and supporting warriors in transition and their families is vastly superior to the previous system. <coughs> we acknowledge, however, that it absolutely needs to work better. Over the past 18 months, the Army has made tremendous improvements in our ability to streamline the disability process, the medical evaluation board process, and orders process are likewise streamlined, wasted time eliminated and soldiers' rights preserved. However, improvements under the current statute still cannot fully address soldiers' concerns over quality of life, compensation, future income stream gaps, or family health care coverage for soldiers that are separated with medical disabilities. Our wounded warriors deserve to have a physical disability evaluation system, PDES if you will, which is uncomplicated, easily understood, but above all, fair. The Army develops strategies, programs, and initiatives to improve the physical disability evaluation process. Additionally, a training certification program is now part of the physical disability evaluation system, ensuring caregivers, care managers, and administrative personnel involved in each area of warrior care are certified annually. These courses are now an annual certification requirement in, the respective, in their respective disciplines. We still have room to improve this process as well. We reduce the bureaucratic burdens on our wounded warriors several, through several initiatives, including casework forms reduction, increases in accessibil accessibility to lawyers, a physical disability evaluation handbook for wounded warriors and their families, a MyMeb, MyPeb medical evaluation board, physical evaluation board webpage on the uh, Army Knowledge Online system for wounded warriors to track the status of their disability cases and Department of Veterans Affairs counseling prior to discharge from the Army. Lastly, case processing results across the three PEBs were reviewed, analyzed, and periodic samples taken with the help of the Concepts Analysis Agency. We now have greater consistency in physical evaluation board review process. Manning the warrior transition units is only second to manning those units preparing to deploy. 
Warrior transition units are filled with multi-component soldiers to meet the needs of our total force. Human Resources Command, in conjunction with senior commanders, continues to continue to fill these billets very quickly as the mission dictates, but not quickly enough, I will admit. Senior commanders, as part of the triad of leadership, are critical to this effort. They are currently assigning qualified, and I emphasize qualified, permanent party cadre to meet mission needs while we focus on providing them backfills for their support and the support. We are changing our permanent change of station reporting timelines for our WTUs to better meet the intent of keeping soldiers fit for duty quickly, who are fit for duty, quickly to their next assignment. This change is eliminating the delay in backlogged soldiers remaining in the warrior transition unit at many installations, and soon, very soon, all installations. The orders process has also been streamlined further by reducing and redirecting communications between the Human Resources Command and directly with the respective warrior transition unit. Previously, soldiers, soldier statuses were, soldier notifications were passing through multiple layers of command to, in order to be executed, no more. In closing, Army dedication to our wounded warriors is unwavering, unwavering. And we are committed to continually seek improvements in all aspects of wounded warrior care. We know we have come a long way, and we still know, and we also know that we still have a long way to go. But we will not falter. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you for your continued support, both of the United States Army, our wounded warriors, and families that we are all honored to serve. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. General Molson. Madam Chair, Congressman McHugh, distinguished members of the uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Army Medical Action Plan and Installation Management Command's uh, issue of uh, recent uh, initiatives on uh, warrior and transition units. We, alongside the Surgeon General and the Army G1, are working hard to provide warriors in transition and their families the care and support they need in an environment most conducive to their healing process. I would like to highlight our transform system of care and support. Additionally, I will present what we have done and what we are doing in facility support. The Army has revised the support structure for the wounded. Warrior transition units, or WTUs, have replaced legacy medical hold, holdover units and medical retention processing units with a robust command and control structure, administrative support, and managed care. We currently have 35 warrior transition <coughs> units in modified existing facilities consisting of barracks, soldier family assistance centers, and headquarters buildings. The needs of the warriors in transition and quality of the facilities in our primary, is our primary consideration. We are building new ADA-compliant facilities and locating them as close as possible to our medical treatment facilities to promote the healing process. Congress has supported warriors in transition by passing the FYOH supplemental, which includes WTU projects at seven locations valued at $138 million as highlighted in our written statement and for the record. The <coughs> Army is working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense to build complex complexes to meet WTU requirements in FY09 and beyond. Our support plan includes new construction to build a permanent mix of ADA compliant one plus one and uh, it's one plus one barracks and apartment style facilities to best provide for our warriors in transition. Military construction for warriors in, tr in transition complexes are based on projected Army requirements and locations of the medical, Army medical treatment facilities. This footprint considers the projected growth of our WTU populations, our BRAC realignments, and the Grow, Grow the Army initiatives. Our warriors in transition consist of a 50-50 active duty or active component and reserve component 
soldiers. The dramatic increase in wounded, ill, and injured soldiers continues to challenge us in providing timely and adequate facilities for those deserving soldiers and their families. We are confident that our efforts will have a significant and lasting positive impact on the way we care for our soldiers. Warrior care is our highest priority, second only to the global war on terror. Our policy is to house warriors in transition in the best available facilities the Army can provide. While we have made significant progress over the last year, <coughs> we realize that we have much work to do to ensure our warriors in transition receive the world-class care and support they deserve. The support of Congress is critical and appreciated. The Installation Management Command pledges in uniting efforts to those challenges and to ensure the success of this critical program. Our soldiers and their families deserve nothing less. Thank you very much. Thank I you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Rubenstein. Madam Chair, Representative McHugh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm Major General David Rubenstein and I'm the Deputy Surgeon General for the Army. And on behalf of Lieutenant General Schoomaker, I want to thank you for hosting this meeting today. I'm also very honored to represent the tens of thousands of dedicated men and women who provide health care, support, and supervision to our wounded, injured, and ill soldiers, our warriors, and their family members. In this regard, we have no higher priority except for putting boots on the ground itself in Iraq and Afghanistan. And today we have 9,000 pair of medical boots on the ground in those two theaters of war. This morning there was an article in USA Today, which I think is a bit of a success story. In this article, the uh, author talks about the fact that soldiers can wait 2 to 12 months to be transitioned out of a warrior transition unit. I think that's a good news story. We are giving our warriors the time they need to heal the time they need to heal and return as productive citizens of their community, and the time they need to heal to return as productive soldiers in their units. We have soldiers in Iraq fighting the war on a prosthetic leg because we gave them the time they needed to heal. We have soldiers jumping out of airplanes on a prosthetic leg because we gave them the time they need to heal. We have a soldier in graduate school today. When he finishes, he will go to West Point in uniform as an active duty instructor to new cadets. He's blind as a result of injuries from Iraq. He's in graduate school because we gave him the time he needs to heal. Some would say that we're a step slow. I have no argument with that complaint. Some say that we're not keeping up with the explosive growth of the population in our WTUs. I have no argument with that as well. We're doing phenomenal work at very, very difficult mission, which is to keep pace with the growth of our WTUs, to ensure that we have trained and qualified cadre, to ensure that we have trained and qualified health care providers to provide the very best in health care, support, and supervision. It's not unlike a story that I'll share with you related to my deployment to Bosnia. When I left to go to Bosnia, I left behind a wife and two school-age kids. Seven months that I was gone saw our son grow seven inches in those seven months. No matter how hard my wife tried, the shoes were always one size too small and the pants were always one size too short. But she never gave up. I, I believe in my heart that you know that we will not give up. We are working diligently at executing an outstanding Army Medical Action Plan but there are challenges in its execution, and I'm very excited to spend some time today talking about our responses to those shortfallings and our responses to improving a system that is so good at supporting our warriors. Thank you very much, and thank you also for your openness. I acknowledge that, uh, ma'am, your staffers have been very open with all of their findings, sharing them with uh, myself, with General Cheek, with our staff, and our Surgeon General, and that has helped us between our committee testimony to continue working on the findings that you have and the findings that we ourselves come up with. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we appreciate your support on our trip to Fort Drum as well. Yes, please. General Cheek. Madam Chair, Representative McHugh, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about our warrior transition units and the care that we provide to our wounded, ill, and injured soldiers and their families. 
I'd also like to thank Congress for the leadership and support you provide to the Army in the development and execution of this program. After Brigade Command in Afghanistan and then service on both the Joint and Army staffs, my selection as the Director for Warrior Care and Transition truly caught me by surprise. But I quickly told my assignment officer it would be my honor to do that job. And, and here's why. Every senior leader in the Army has some kind of direct and personal experience with our wounded, ill, and injured soldiers and their families. Mine is personified in Lieutenant Colonel Greg Gadsden, his wife Kim, and, the, and their children Gabby and Jalen. You know Greg Gadsden as the wounded soldier who inspired the New York Giants to win the Super Bowl. But I know him from our service in combat together, a magnificent leader, trusted confidant, and a loyal friend. He and his family motivate me to do all I can for our wounded, ill, and injured soldiers, all volunteers to our nation in a time of war. When I assumed my duties from Brigadier General Mike Tucker on the 1st of May, he made it clear that this effort was a work in progress. But from my vantage point, the accomplishments of the Army and the leadership of Mike Tucker were remarkable. In contrast to what the Army had in place in February of 2007, not just Walter Reed, but across the Army, we made enormous progress. Superb facilities, traditional military structure, dedicated cadre and medical care providers, centralized family assistance and appropriate prioritization, all underpinned by a deep care for the well-being of our soldiers and their families. Now certainly this program has been imperfect and execution uneven. But I believe we are well on our way to institutionalizing this as an enduring Army mission. We will continue to refine and improve the program, and to that end, these are my marching orders as we move ahead. First is to understand the dramatic growth in warrior transition unit population and become proactive in meeting future demands. Next, empower commanders with more options for managing our wounded, ill, and injured soldiers. Refine our entry and exit criteria to better focus the warrior transition units on those who truly require complex managed care. And then address the current issues that limit us from optimal performance and soldier satisfaction, such as maintaining our cadre strength, managing high-risk soldiers, streamlining our evaluation boards, and also our assignment processes. Again, let me say thank you for your leadership and support to this extremely important Army program. When I tell you I'm committed to its enduring success, it's because of soldiers like Greg Gadsden. During my promotion to general officer, he stood on his prosthetic led legs and administered my oath of office, a personal reminder to me to make this program the best in the world, and I'm greatly honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, perhaps we'll start with resources and why um, it's been very difficult to properly resource the warrior transition units. I wonder if you could take us through some of the bureaucratic constraints and how that has borne itself out, not just um, among the, the military population, but also in recruiting civilians to be part of this effort. Could you help us out with that? And I mean, part of our purpose here, obviously, is to understand it and see, is there a way we can help? Is there something that can be done that will really make it much easier to go through what sometimes is a very painful process of releasing people from one duty or another? Um, where have the problems been? What, has, what have you done since the spring to correct some of the issues that have come to light that perhaps were not anticipated to the extent that they were? But let me, allow me to start, if I may, uh, Madam Chair. First of all, because I think the most significant resource that concerns the uh, subcommittee uh, is both is people. Uh, and make no mistake about it, the, the Army is stretched. Uh, our chief has, has testified to that. Uh, the Secretary of the Army ha has also testified to the fact that we're stretched. That said, I want to reiterate that this is the number one priority for, for people resources right behind the war on terror and resourcing our deployers. We must field units fully manned, best equipped, and best led. That's, that goes without, without uh, amplification. Your question is on the bureaucracy, primarily. The bureaucracy that we, one, I will state, we, we first of all a bit overwhelmed ourselves with 
the, uh, with the execution order. Healing warriors. We overwhelmed ourselves. And, and having revisited the uh, prior hearings on this subject, uh, the four prior hearings on this subject, uh, it is clear to me that this committee perhaps foresaw that a little better than, than we anticipated it. But our heart was in the right place and remains in the right place, providing the very best care for our, our wounded warriors, those who bore in the battle. But to the bureaucracy, we didn't anticipate that at the lowest level, the installation level, the execution order would be interpreted by the personnel clerk at Fort X and Fort Y as being no different than an order to reassign a soldier who is leaving a unit that is simply not deploying or a unit that is training at home station. In other words, typically an order will be issued, assignment instructions will be issued, and the administrative individuals at a lower installation level would look at 90 days, 30 days for leave, 90 days to prepare to, to transition that soldier out. We didn't anticipate that. That wasn't the intent. When it was discovered, we jumped on it. The only way to, to the larger issue, the only way to adequately resource a flexibly growing organization, and that's what our warrior transition units are, we, we knew that going in, is at the local level first. That was articulated first in April of 2008 by General Cody. It has been re-articulated in uh, fragmentation, fragmentary order number three, and I think we will see a lot, better. in fact, I'm confident we will see a lot better execution mm -hmm. at the lowest level and at the highest level. You mentioned the 90 days. How has that been shortened? It's been shortened based upon whether the individual has several ways. First of all, very clear standards, five days from the point at which an individual is identified to Human Resources Command as return to duty, healthy, fit, Return, returnable to duty, five days for Human Resources Command to publish the order, five additional days, excuse me, not publish the order, issue the request for assignment and the request for orders. The orders are cut at the local installation level, five additional days for that to occur, and then 60 days for an individual who is leaving the installation for the report date. So 60 days from the date the order is cut, if you're leaving the installation, go into another installation, that's the report date. If you're staying on the installation, it's 10 days. Can we look to some figures as of uh, June and, and beyond that demonstrate that that's changed significantly? It's too early, Madam Chairman, but it will, it will not be too early by the 1st of October, and I, I welcome the opportunity to share that data with you. Yes, I'm, I was going to mention something about keeping the data we're keeping now, but it's, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. it, it is too early now, but by uh, the 1st of October, we'll have a mountain of data that we'll be happy to share with the committee. Okay, thank you, uh, General. And perhaps later in the discussion, we'll talk a little bit about outreach to civilians also who might be um, very, very helpful in, and uh, uh, welcoming this opportunity to serve in this way. Mr. McHugh? Thank you, Madam Chair. To repeat myself, I said during my opening remarks that I've found no reason to question anyone's motivation here. Certainly at the, at the installation level, these people are working as hard as they possibly can, oftentimes outside areas of training and expertise to do what they feel is necessary. That having been said, in many ways, this challenge isn't being met. And I find the current circumstances unacceptable. You gentlemen agree with that? Anybody disagree with that? So what, what I think frustrates us, what frustrates me, as we talk about the challenges, we talk about the shortfalls, what we have repeatedly heard is that, well, we've taken care of that problem Installation managers or installation uh, commanders have been given the authority to take whatever personnel they need 
uh, we've done uh, this, that, and, and the next thing. And while that sounds good, there still seems to be a disconnect between what is being told as to the resolution and what is being experienced on the ground. And, and let's just use the growth as an example. You did have huge, huge growth. From June of 07, this program had 6,000 uh, in the population in the various WTUs. Uh, by June of this year, a year later, it had doubled to 12,000, and it's projected by spring or late winter of next year, February to June, roughly, to grow to another 20,000. The original program in the implementation uh, initiative was intended to have a 90-day review period by which this growth could be projected and thereby accommodated, and yet, for whatever reason, that hasn't worked. What I'm trying to understand is why have we not been able to catch up to this growth in terms of the personnel? Is it that the 90-day review period, the 90-day look didn't occur, or that it did occur and we do see the growth, we just can't keep up with it? Where is the shortfall here? Is it an inability for the model to accurately project where these new warriors are going to come from, or and in what numbers, or is it an inability to react to them to find the personnel to put to put on to reach our, our required ratios? I'll start off on that one, sir, Thanks. if I may, and, Thanks, and uh, pass off as required. Um, we have thousands, literally thousands, of civilian open hiring actions that are on the books with valid job descriptions that we have uh, put out looking for hires, looking for civilians to step up and take those jobs. And, and we have filled thousands as well. Some uh, aligned towards the WTUs, others aligned to the, the, the uh, other parts of the medical, surgical, and health care mission. And so it's not a, a matter of not putting the actions out there and, and uh, looking for civilian hires. We've also transferred a huge number of military to this mission both in the healthcare arena, which is my area, and uh, in the, uh, the the more generic cadre, squad leaders, platoon sergeants, and the like. The, uh, Can I, that one, I interrupt you to ask a question there, because what we have heard as we talk about the civilian hire process is that it is structured currently in a way that's very frustrating to those uh, at the WTUs. And by that, I mean they're hired at, or certainly recruited at low GS levels. Uh, the pay may not be, or the level may not be where it, where it should be to f be competitive in the in the civilian sector to bring in those those folks you're trying to hire. And even when you get them, because the the, the GS is so low, they within a year or so go on to a higher GS, so you lose them all over again. Have you have you experienced that? Well, Can you use some help and maybe? Uh, plusing up and hiring at a l higher GS level? Actually, we've gotten rid of the GS system altogether. And we well, have I'm, I'm archaic, called but you don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, under NSPS, we have the flexibility to offer pay within a band, and we're very competitive. In fact, in some communities, we're too competitive for the higher actions that we're, we're applying. Then we're taking, why are you not able to hire these individuals if you are competitive? Because what you just told me is you're not getting them. We're not getting them. We're offering uh, recruiting bonuses. We're offering relocation bonuses. Uh, we're, we're going overboard to make this financially uh, lucrative, uh, to m certainly not to be paying less than the local community. Um, one thing that this committee can do is to help us with the direct hire authority. This is a year-to-year -year program. Um, I was mowing the yard in Augusta, Georgia, as the deputy commander of the medical center, and a new uh, family had moved in next door. The wife was a nurse. I uh, asked her, as we were talking, I asked her to come apply for a job at, at uh, Eisenhower Army Medical Center. Talked to her a couple months later, said, I haven't seen you around the hospital. She said, I didn't get a job. Why not? You didn't hire me fast enough, and I needed a job, and, you, and I couldn't wait for that system to, to uh, make it through. The direct hire authority allows us to hire very quickly, but it's a year-to-year -year program, and we could certainly use that as a permanent uh, benefit or a per permit right for us to go out and hire. To the question of, of pay, I do not believe that we're paying less than the civilian sector, and in some communities we're paying more and we're taking from the civilian sector. Well, I'm not, I'm not here to argue with you, but I'm telling you that's not what we're being, we've been told. We have been told by folks who really ought to be in a position to know 
that that is a challenge in the hiring bands uh, that have uh, been assigned to these hires in fact encourage folks to leave in a rather short order um, so I certainly and we certainly can't compete with a community that offers an, uh, offers offers a nurse 40 hours of pay for two 12-hour shifts at a downtown emergency room but we you can't told me you were them. overly competitive general I, which are you I, I can't compete with that kind of an offer but if you're talking about a medical surge nurse if we're talking about the staff that we're looking for to staff our WTUs, I don't believe that we're paying less than the local community. Now, nurses are a shortage across our country. And in some communities, as we're competing against health care systems that are uh, out there in, uh, in a for-profit motive, uh, we, we do have difficulty. I don't deny that. But let, allow me, if I may, sir, to, uh, to amplify uh, two points. Uh, you asked a question about agility, and I will tell you that, in, that heretofore we anticipated that our system was a, was a bit more agile in responding to the changes in structure requirements at installation by installation by installation than it really has been. In my comment, I mentioned, in my earlier comment, I mentioned that the only way to respond to that is the way that fragment, fragmentary order number three calls us to respond to it, locally first and then we back bill from the higher level to, the, to if I may, to sure. the civilian personnel sure. issue. I want to amplify the fact, having spent a little bit of time trying to recruit nurses uh, and testifying before this committee in that capacity, uh, that it's a national, it's a national crisis. Uh, I, I've said that before. Uh, when you see governors, if you will, poaching across state lines to hire nurses from a neighboring state because we simply can't grow enough and our nation isn't growing enough, that becomes problematic. The, the Army is seriously exploring uh, ways in which we can grow our own. And I'm, I'm speaking of a, a United States Army nursing school as an example. Well, the, the, I, I certainly, and Madam Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back here in a second, but I understand the nursing shortage. There, there, is, there is a challenge on these, on these ratios that, that extend beyond nursing, however. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, General General Rubens, I don't I don't mean to engage you in a debate per se, but my my frustration is here. What kinds of things do we need as a Congress, and do you need as a command structure to do to meet that ongoing challenge? That that really is the point. What what some of the installation folks are telling us is that the hiring levels. Uh, and they didn't mention specifically, I did not just mention, I should say, nurses, but, but listed it uh, in a broader array. But what, what can we do to try to fix that? And, and I want to come back when we can, Madam Chair, I mean, the, the disconnect between some of the, uh, the fragos, the fragmentary orders and such is, is uh, frustrating as well. And on, temp or, uh, I should, uh, on semi permanent buildings, for example, there's a $750,000 cap on the bidding of those. Um, and supposedly, you've got a frago that, that has lifted that that has never been implemented. So, in the meantime, s installations are still trying to deal with that $750,000 cap. Um, when it's recognized it's a problem, the, the implementation or the waiver has been issued, but it's never been exercised. So we got some problems there. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. You know. and I certainly you. wanted to let you go over as they were completing their, their responses. And I think that there does seem to be some confusion because a number of individuals that are very engaged in the system and on the ground uh, working with it, uh, I didn't get the sense that they uh, saw that the GS system was no longer something that, that um, was at play here and that you had some of the options that you have so we, maybe we need to really understand that better we'll go we'll go we'll come back to that general thank you very much miss boyda thank you madam chairwoman for calling this it's um it's something that we obviously hear about a great deal i have the opportunity to represent fort riley and fort leavenworth of course fort riley is where we have the wtu and um you know i applaud and i I tell people when they ask a lot, what about Walter Reed? How are things going? And so for several months, I said, wow, I, you know, I think we've really got our handle on this. And we're out there working on behalf of these wounded soldiers. And people were very happy to hear that. Uh, at this point, I would say that you know, I, I hear from constituents or just different people from time to time about a problem every now and then. 
And then you re get to a point where you recognize that there's a problem that something has to be done with. And I would, um, with all due respect, again, say that there, there seems to me to be a disconnect, and I, I don't doubt at all your commitment and what's in your heart to do this, but I would offer that there seems to be a real disconnect about what's going on in, in you, perhaps your vision of what's going on and what's happening on the ground. There seems to be more of a disconnect um, that I'm comfortable with, and I think hopefully we'd like to make sure that that is connected, that that reality is connected, and we start doing some things about what's going on. I think we're going to have time for a couple of rounds, so I know in the interest of, of time, I have several questions, but when we, when just the whole thing about we were going from 6,000 to 12,000, now it's projected to 20,000, if you could answer the questions as possibly as quickly, but was that, did we anticipate that? What happened with that? And I know the whole 90-day thing just was a good idea, but it didn't really come to pass the way we wanted. But how did we go from 6 to 12, and why was, where did that happen? Uh, Ma'am, I'm probably the best one to answer that. And uh, one of the key reasons we saw such a dramatic growth in our warrior transition units is we, we put out a directive for our units to move soldiers that were in their medical evaluation board process into the WTUs, or at least allowed deploying commanders to do that. Uh, that, of course, had some benefit to them in pr helping them. Wasn't work. that originally in, in or did we, did we project those, that doubling then? Did we, because it was my understanding that that was what we had projected to do in the first place. So that. We did project growth, and in fact, what we built our original structure for was about 8,000 growth in February of, of this year, which, which turned out to be pretty accurate. Um, but it continued to grow, which we also forecasted, but as we've said, we just were not agile enough uh, to respond to that. Mm -hmm. as, we, as we look back on that, one of the things that we recognized was that we had not sufficiently empowered our commanders in that triad of leadership on the installations with enough, enough options on how they could best manage this population. So our recent fragmentary order really gives them more discretion and some options in terms of who they bring into the warrior transition units as well as some opportunities for soldiers who may be just almost completing their care and ready to return to duty to allow them to go back to their units. So we're trying to give more options to the commanders to help manage that population better. And then also uh, some greater latitude for them in terms of assigning uh, cadre members. And, and we've made a lot of progress in some of the things that we, we used, like borrowed military manpower to support warrior transition units, had a lot of second order effects uh, for special duty pay and other things, it just did not work out well for us. So we, mm -hmm. we've learned a lot of lessons over the past six months. As we look forward from here, we're going to build a structure which, which we will not require a formal structure to build cadre. We're going to build cadre based on the size of the population. So that's, that's, that's what we're going for. But we'll build structure for mm -hmm. 16,000 uh, by January, and then we'll, we, and, and for 12,000, we'll have the official structure built with our new uh, ratios that were developed by our manpower agencies. So we have a lot of changes. Reclaim my time here. That crazy clock just keeps on going. One of the things that we I have heard about is administrative levels are coming in at the GS4 and 5, and it's just unacceptable to try to, to ask anybody to do that sort of thing. And so at, the, at these administrative levels, your nurses and some of the more uh, medical providers, but uh, I think, again, from what we're hearing, there's a real disconnect on just keeping people on the ground who keep these kinds of things going. Uh, they're coming in at, at GS5. They're temporary. Uh, there's all kinds of problems associated with it, and we need to know what we need to do to get that to be something that's just going to work a whole lot better. One of the things that our staff has heard about, this is not a personal experience of mine, but has heard about for warriors that are in transition that now have, have gone through, they're ready to serve, they want to go back into the cadre of the WTU. They're ready to do that, and they're told, and let me get the exact words, the Human Resources Command that said the, the warrior transition unit was, quote, over strength according to their per personnel authorization document. That was the number one reason that they were given for not being able to go right back in to a place where they could help the fastest. So, again, I, I'm assuming that we're going to be taking care of that. I can't see. Am I in red? Shoot. Yes, ma'am. We, we've changed that. And so we'll, we'll allow those soldiers to stay 
and the, and the commanders will have some discretion to move them into cadre. Okay. I would be happy to, I'll wait to my next round of questions then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, I sit here uh, really in great uh, appreciation, truthfully, for the task that you have been assigned. And I know that it, with anything, when you have numbers, it's just very difficult to put it together, especially when we have these absolutely wonderful young men and women who uh, have served this nation and even as they recover from their wounds, they still want to give. And uh, uh, they are God's gift, quite frankly. They're very special. I'm not going to be, I, I guess what I wanted to, to bring forward knowing that you are in the process of trying to make this program an efficient, a beneficial a program uh, that will be in place. Something that's bothered me for the last four or five years, I'm like anybody here on this committee, I go to Walter Reed, I go to Bethesda, and I see those who um, are the severe wounded. Uh, they will not go back to any unit. Uh, their life is from the standpoint of serving this nation, nation in uniform is, is over. What kind of program, uh, General Rubenstein, I guess maybe I should ask you, or General uh, Cheek, what type of program is the Army working on to have a continued contact, if you will, with that um, traumatic brain injury soldier or PTSD once that they get past this part of their service and they are in the process of leaving the military, are you having a program, developing a program so that when all of us are retired and the people that replace you, that replace us, will know where that soldier is 10, 15 years? And, and, sir, this program really belongs to General Rochelle, but we have our Army Wounded Warrior Program, which is, is designed for our most severely wounded and injured. And, and for each of those soldiers, we maintain a, a case manager, if you will, who, who maintains contact with that soldier and his family to help them with any, you know, problems that, that they have. And I don't know, General Rochelle, if you want to add any more. I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Uh, the, the program we were discussing is, is, again, the Army Wounded Warrior Program, and it is designed and was designed in uh, 2005 uh, for, for, in 2004 for our most severely wounded to ensure that we were giving them the special treatment, the special focused care. Quite frankly, uh, I, would, I would tell the committee that it is the precursor to the uh, Wounded Warrior, excuse me, the precursor to the Warrior Transition Unit. It was built on that model. And it is a commitment for life for those severely wounded soldiers. The second thing that I, uh, and final thing I'd like to add is that uh, for directed care, every single one of those soldiers, over 3,000 today, has a, every single one has a case manager who is assigned to him or her and follows them throughout their recovery, follows them throughout their, their lifetime for, for any need whatsoever they may have. The last point is that in the last, uh, twice in the last two years, we have hosted uh, symposiums for our wounded warriors, inviting them to come back at the Army's expense. And there have been individuals who have come who could not represent themselves, they were physically present, but they were represented by their loved ones. And we go through four days. This recently happened in uh, June. Uh, four days in Indianapolis, I might add. Four days of, of taking their issues and then bringing those issues back inside the Army to incorporate them into the overall family action plan that Lieutenant General Wilson oversees on behalf of the Vice Chief of Staff. So I wish to assure the committee that the Army wounded warriors are most severely wounded uh, and who deserve, rightfully so, our lifetime of commitment are in fact receiving it. I would also like to point out that in addition to the Army wounded warrior program, uh, the uh, Office of the Surgeon General has placed a colonel into Dr. Jim Peake, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs office, 
and he likewise has put a, an equal ranked civilian into OTSG so that we can uh, go further down the road of building bridges and connections between the DVA and the health, uh, health services of the DVA and uh, the Army to uh, supplement the AW2 that General Rochelle has just described. General, thank you, Madam Chairman. Time's up. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Angus. Well, I want to thank Chairwoman Davis and Mr. McHugh for holding this important hearing and for all the hard work you've done uh, as we've become so aware of the great challenge this presents. And we're hearing the questions and challenges we have about projecting the need uh, that you might have to address and provide for. And we all know, and you, certainly in your testimony, we've heard how difficult that is. But as we face a situation in which potentially one, we'll have a large influx into the system as a surge soldiers come home. Uh, if we do eventually engage in a timetable for the redeployment of our soldiers, so again, you'll be bringing back larger numbers at once, and particularly in uh, it, where the issue is PTSD, uh, where you might not have to really deal with it till the soldiers do come home. Can you envision what you would do in a, in a situation where you simply become overwhelmed by the demand? I mean, ha do you look to other sources for help? Uh, how do you plan for that so that uh, as you anticipate it, you know what you're going to do, whether it's from within the service or looking outside? And I, I ask that to any I'll, one of you who wants to Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll start the, the answer on, on that. Uh, to the extent that we can, we certainly want to keep our, our wounded warriors and in, in the example that you have given the, uh, the psychologically wounded warriors as well as our physically uh, wounded warriors, but keep them in our system to put our arms around them and to provide care. And we're doing a very good job at, at keeping as many as possible. Uh, we do occasionally send our, our warriors down to community health care providers and bring them back uh, where we can't provide all of the care or the specific piece of care uh, in our facilities. Uh, where we can't and where we may not be able to meet the needs if the numbers are overwhelming, we fall to our, our civilian network providers, our, uh, our partners in the TRICARE uh, contracts with our three, uh, our three partners, uh, South, East, and North, and uh, use them to supplement the care that we cannot provide. And is this a plan you have in place so that it kicks in automatically, or is it really um, reacting to any given moment? It's, it's a plan that is in execution as we speak today. In, uh, in October at uh, Fort Hood, we sent uh, about 350 of our warriors downtown Colleen, uh, Harker Height, uh, Copper Scove to receive health care. Um, those same soldiers six months later in, in April of this year uh, had 1,900 separate appointments downtown. So we already use the system that's in place. May I add, ma'am? Uh, Madam Songus, uh, the two things that uh, you hinted in your question is being proactive uh, in looking at both the deployment of individual elements of uh, Army units, brigades, and, and support elements, uh, and, and being proactive for those that are redeploying as well. That, we have come to learn, is, is one of our, our misconnects, disconnects at the, at the senior levels of the Army, and we're going to do better at that. We already have a very reliable, very reliable metric that proves itself time and again as the number of soldiers that are being sent to the warrior transition unit prior to a brigade deployment. Our effort under Fraggle 3 is to, to implement that and get in front of it. What I will add, though, is that we are seeing such a disparate statistical behavior pattern for redeploying brigades that we're still trying to arrive at a reliable uh, one standard deviation, if you one or two standard deviation, if you will, prediction for redeploying brigades. We're not quite there yet. The number is too erratic. Uh, the, the history is too erratic, excuse me. But that is our effort. That is our commitment. <coughs> well, it seems to be an important one because a lot of this problem has come about for failure to anticipate and really think long term and understand what, what the alternatives would be should the worst case start to realize itself. And, and ma'am, we are, we are doing that. I mean, we're taking the redeploying brigades. We know, for example, in Fort Campbell, between November and uh, January, that they'll have four brigades redeploying and another brigade deploying. So we, we can see already a need to plus up their cadre and prepare, potentially, as you mentioned, for uh, increased mental health issues uh, from those redeploying units. So we're moving uh, in that direction. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Dr. Snyder? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to thank you, Ms. Davis and Mr. McHugh, for not just this hearing, because this issue is one that you all have had an interest in in some time, and I, I think it's in the, the best spirit of congressional oversight uh, that, that this hearing be conducted. And, and, and I also want to acknowledge, and perhaps you uh, did during your earlier statements, the, the work that Dave Kildee and Jeanette James, our staff, have done on this issue, because they really have put a lot of time in it. And I think it's been helpful to you all, and it's certainly been helpful to us. And I also appreciate the four of you. It's never fun to com come before this committee um, having to acknowledge that there are problems. I, I would say it's actually less fun to come before this committee when everyone knows there's problems but you, and you can't acknowledge it. So I think you're ahead of the game here today by acknowledging you've got work to do, and I, and I appreciate it. I, I, I need a tutorial here because I don't understand. I hate to say this, Madam Chair, but the clock has not been started. I, <laughs> I, should have, I could have sat here for hours. And I, um, I, I need a tutorial on this. <clears throat> we, we have the Wounded Warriors Program to which Mr. Jones referred of about 3,000 personnel. Uh, correct? And, and that, that's not a group that we're discussing today. Is that a fair statement? What we're talking about is a separate program, the Warriors in Transition Program, which we think is probably 12,300 or somewhere in that range. Of those 12,300, uh, uh, General Cheek, maybe you're the person to sort this out for me the best. Uh, and maybe we, we can either take it in totality or we can take a, a hypothetical fort somewhere and take 500 or something and just try to sort them out. How many of those are uh, Iraq or Afghan war veterans? Sir, I think uh, about 70 percent of our population has been deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. 70 percent of, of the population? In yes, sir. The, and then states. about, probably about half the population are actually in the Warrior Transition Unit for some deployment-related condition. And, and as we continue to back off of that, about one-third were evacuated from theater and currently about 12 to 13 percent were what we would call wounded in action in, in terms of a Purple Heart recipient. So that's sort of how that population breaks out. Now, when you, you have, uh, you made mention that you have at one of the units, there's about 300 are considered in a, in a waiting list. Is that correct? Is that your testimony? Well, I know, I know, sir, when your staff visited Fort Hood, uh, they were told there was a, a list of soldiers waiting to enter the WTU. Based what, what, uh, I don't understand that. What does it mean to be on a waiting list? Well, I mean, sir, this I, seems to be contrary to the whole point of, of this. The, the whole point was to create a program which would say from day one, you will have somebody on top of your problems, not to say, oh, by the way, you're number 273. It takes about six weeks to get there before we'll even begin to get started on your problem. What, where did this concept of a waiting list come up to be in a, in a warrior transition unit? As, as, sir, I, I, I probably owe you a better answer, but let me give you my, my best understanding of that. When we gave guidance to commanders to be able to move their medical evaluation board soldiers to the WTUs, I think that's principally where this waiting list comes from. So th these are soldiers that um, have a permanent profile that needs completion of an evaluation to determine fitness uh, to remain in the Army or not. In, in the past, we left those soldiers in their unit, and they didn't go to the Warrior Transition Unit. And so I think that's principally where that, that list lies. The, if you take a soldier, just as an example, who's very seriously injured, we're going to put him in the Warrior Transition Unit. He's not going to be left on a waiting to, list. To put, yeah. Sir, to put a face on, on that example, um, I don't know, and I don't know that we have been able to duplicate this 311 as an example, uh, but a soldier who's uh, lifting weights and blows out his shoulder and needs to be evaluated whether or not he's going to be able to stay in the Army or not, and his unit commander says, I want to nominate this soldier to go to the WTU. That's the kind of soldier, if there is a soldier who's not come over, that's a, the kind of soldier who's not come over. Not a soldier who's been wounded in combat and, and needs uh, the services and the support structure that that's available to a WT in a WTU, if that makes any sense. It, it, it does, and it, it gets part of what I want to talk about. I, I think the original concept of this was that perhaps we would not try to differentiate between, you know, those that got severely you know, got gun gunshot wound in a, in a training accident in, in Kansas versus hurt overseas that we would say they've got medical problems and need to be dealt with. 
but when it gets so inclusive that we're now having problems keeping keeping up, I, I want to hear you, General Chief, talk about what what are the categories of these these twelve thousand plus that we have now. You, re, you refer to some as being high risk. Yes, sir. What what are the other categories that you have delineated amongst those twelve thousand plus people? Well, the the we have we can categorize them categorize them any number of of ways. Um, I think what I would point out is. Well, are you saying that these are that these are not formal categories? I was in, had the impression that somewhere there's a list of we have this many people that we now label as high risk, and I can hit a computer button, and pull up that list, and see how they're doing. Are, is this or is this not a formal classification? The, you the high have? risk, yes, sir. A waiting list it would be that. That's what I. That's the more I'm, formal thing. Yes, I'm, sir. Yeah, I'm, I moved on from that. But For now, of, of your the way you see it, so you have some that are designated as high risk, and you assign them additional resources. Of those others, are there other distinctions between them? Um, I, I don't know that I, I know enough to give you the answer on the other categories, but for the high risk, yes, we have a very formal process for every single soldier in the, in the warrior transition units where his leadership, his, his squad leader, and his, his medical managers all take a look at this entire soldier, uh, not just his medical condition, but his personal life and other issues that he may have. And they'll make an assessment based on all of those factors. And these were formalized in a, in a directive to the field that was put out in February of this year. So we'll, we will go through that and then we'll rate that soldier as, as high risk. Every one of those soldiers is an individual and all of them are high risk for a, a unique reason. And so the, the, the strategy for coping with that is unique as well. Some might be assigned a buddy. Some might be limited uh, in terms of uh, how much liberty they have to go from place to place. Uh, some might have increased contact with a squad leader or additional counseling, for example, if it's a, it's a problem with their family life, et cetera. So all of this is, uh, is very personalized. The, the, one of the great features of this, and this is, as usual, and it was an outgrowth of, of what we had at Fort Knox when we, we had a, a suicide there or, or a, a poly... Uh, uh, accidental death by taking too much uh, medication. We completely relooked our policies, and even while we've had a doubling in the size of our warrior transition unit population, we've actually cut in half the number of suicides and accidental deaths. So we've had some good success with this program, even though 311 at one installation will sound like a large number, but it's actually helping us and uh, take take care of these soldiers. My time's up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. I think we would certainly all agree that anyone who um, is in, in a critical status absolutely uh, needs to, to be there. But I'm also a little confused on your response because it seems like the people who um, have been already cleared to be part of the, D the WTU are still on the waiting list. And is there a kind of disconnect between their unit, their commanders, and the needs of the WTU in terms of whether or not they actually can go, uh, that, that they have the space for them, they have, because it sounds like in many cases you, uh, it's not a matter of space anymore, it's not a matter of, of individuals, some of them obviously are, are way over capacity. To, to help answer the question and to address also a bit about the categorization, it, it is irrelevant to us if the patient was wounded by a gunshot wound in Iraq by an IED in Afghanistan, a, a car wreck in Lampasas, Texas on the way to Fort Hood, or a parachute accident at Fort Bragg, having never deployed in his or her life. What is important to us is the complexity of care that that young man or woman requires to return to duty or to return to his or her community as a civilian. Uh, and so I, I'm a little, I'm a little um, concerned about the concept of a waiting list our focus is getting into the WTU those patients, those soldiers who have complex medical needs that require the supervision and the support that's not, a, that's not available in their units. And, and it's okay if a soldier who has a bad shoulder and is being boarded, that, that's a soldier who can be supervised by his unit. Mm -hmm. And if, if we need to get them in the WTU, we certainly will. But uh, that's not necessarily a requirement for every soldier going through a boarded process. So there's some, there, there's some soldiers who aren't essentially cleared to even go into the WTU because their problem can be um, dealt with locally. That is correct, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Um, 
I wanted to, to just um, go, General Chief, to uh, an, an issue that you raised. You said that borrowed military manpower did not work well. And I know that when our staffs have visited, they came to the same conclusion in talking and working with everyone. But I wonder how you reconcile that fact with General Rochelle's uh, assertion that warrior transition unit personnel shortages need to be handled locally. Yes. What's, the, what's the difference in practical terms from being borrowed versus local? How yes, ma'am. When, when a soldier is borrowed from a unit for duties elsewhere, he's still assigned to that unit. The problem this created was we have special duty pay for those non-commissioned officers that are squad leaders and platoon sergeants. By leaving them assigned to their old unit by our own regulations, and actually it's not within the authority of the Army to pay them that special duty pay. So what we told our commanders is stop using this technique for bolstering the cadre. Assign the soldier, and they can do that on the installation, assign the soldier to the unit that makes them fully eligible for that special duty pay once they've completed the training requirements. So in, in many ways, it's not there's not a big difference, but we want to have a more formal process and eliminate the use of borrowed military manpower because of the problems that it created. Mm -hmm. is, is there a disconnect, though, here? Um, I think you were, you're talking about trying to handle it locally, and yet when we, when we talk about other needs that the military has, we, we're nationwide. You know, we're, uh, so how, how, um, how does that relate to? Make, make no mistake about it, uh, Madam Chair. It, it does stretch us, uh, but it's, there's not a disconnect. Uh, there is not a disconnect, uh, neither in terms of our ability to uh, pay the, the special duty assignment pay, which we've recently increased to $375 for squad leaders and platoon sergeants. And we managed to work with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, I'm pleased to say, to find an adequate workaround that allows us to pay every soldier assigned or in a designated military overstrength position in support of our warrior transition units. That's point number one. Uh, is there a disconnect? You're asking a much larger question. Will we be able to uh, sustain this level of manning? We, we will sustain it because our lead, the Army's leadership has said this is our number one priority immediately behind resourcing our deploying formations. We will sustain it. Is there any difficulty, this special duty pay, I think we were understanding that uh, there was a, a lot of problem in it, whether it's processing the special duty pay, is that the problem? No, it, let, let me see if I can reiterate what General Cheek uh, very correctly stated. For an individual who is not assigned to a position, the position is one that is authorized special duty assignment pay. If you're in a borrowed military uh, manpower, you're on loan from a unit, you're not occupying a position. You, you don't occupy the position. Therefore, the quirk in the system causes you not to be able to receive the special duty assignment mm -hmm. pay. Again, uh, one of my extraordinary senior executive service uh, leaders inside the G1 worked this very, very hard. And recently, within the last week, we put a worldwide message out to the field that explained we have solved this forever and here's how to execute it. Mm -hmm. Can we check up on that one? <laughs> Please do, ma'am. Yeah. Please and, do. And you feel confident that that's the case and I, I am very confident. as we move forward? Very yes, yes ma'am. There were two issues. The, the one was the bar military manpower. The other one was the previous policy mandated experience levels that some of our cadre didn't have. And uh, that's, that's unique to this assignment. For example, if you were a drill sergeant, that was not a requirement. So both of those obstacles were removed, and, and I'm confident we've got this right for the way ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I understand that the, um, the training uh, for the cadre, especially if it was in an area that the person had not experienced before, is it's a relatively short period of training, but mo most of it is really learning on the job. Is that a correct? There, there's an online course, uh, a 40-hour course that they take, and then we're also setting up a course at Fort Sam Houston that'll actually be a resident course. So we'll have we'll, we're going to improve our current one, but the that's the only requirement for training for the special duty pay is uh, is taking the online course. Okay, maybe we'll talk about that in another minute, uh, Mr. McHugh. <laughs> It's good to hear that that's, that's been fixed. My, my understanding, I, I'm just curious for my own clarification, you're actually going to pay retroactively for some of those assignments that were caught 
uh, where they didn't receive the special pay because they were excluded either, as General Shell explained, or they were temporary technical. Let, sir, well, let me answer that, sir, because uh, my understanding right now is that we will have to assist those individuals who are occupying those positions legitimately under, under competent authority uh, with applying to the Board for Correction of Military Records for that. Okay. We, we do not have the authority retroactively to do it. If, if I had the authority, it would be done. Yeah, but you will support that. We will absolutely support okay. that. Uh, I do think that'll, that'll be a big help. Uh, General Chief, you, you, you said that the issue of the Manning documents in H HRC, and I believe it was to Ms. Songus, uh, that you fixed that problem where you'd have the installation commander making an assignment and then having the manual document not validate that assignment. I'm assuming, and I just want to make sure that I'm assuming correctly, the fix is the recent Frago 3. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and we've done a, a couple of things. Um, one of them, as General Rochelle mentioned, if our population exceeds structure, we will use directed military overstrength and assign cadre against that to keep our cadre commensurate with the population. But we're also, we are going to do 90-day reviews. And in October, we're building the, the structure for a 12,000 population. And then we'll follow that when, in January. We're simultaneously building both of these for 16,000. And so we are going to build structures so that we can assign from HRC to those positions. But we will always have the provision to use directed military overstrength if the population exceeds that structure. So in essence, that, that Frago said, under those circumstances, the Manning documents are irrelevant or don't apply, let's use that phrase. Well, they, they will not be. Uh, the, the, what, it, what it does, it directs commanders to make sure that their cadre stays at 100 percent in support of the population. That's what it says, sir. To, to use General Cody's words in a worldwide VTC about a month ago, assigned to population, the paperwork will follow up. Well, and General Cody is a great, great American and a great soldier, but there was a there was a lag at best or a total disconnect between what he said and what was implemented. That's why I think the 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 specifics of this frago is pretty important. Yes, sir. And and just as an example, tomorrow we have a, a video teleconference with Forcecom and our, our 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 major commanders, and they will go line by line, and right. we're going to review this. So. One of the points that you've made about disconnects between our senior leaders in the Army and, and uh, the echelons between all the way down to the, the, the warrior transition unit, you know, I, I'll accept we've had our challenges there, but we are really working hard to get full ownership from the, from the secretary and the chief all the way down to the squad leader, and this is one of our steps uh, to do that. Okay. But, and, and I think that that process tomorrow is a an invaluable one because, frankly, we're still getting anecdotally that problem of manning documents being used as kind of a shortstop against where the intent lies, and that is to, to fill these billets and to meet the challenge. So uh, that's certainly a step uh, in, in the right direction. Uh, talk, talk to me, uh, and I, maybe it'd be General Rochelle, but the the capacity, the structure within this process to judge growth, it seems to me, is critical. Um, General uh, Cheek just mentioned a 90-day review process. The implementation documents for for this program called for 90-day lookbacks to try to ensure that we're projecting growth, we're accommodating current needs, et cetera, et cetera, and yet there were shortcomings. Was it an inadequate evaluation process? Was that 90-day period not sufficient? Or was it we knew all about it, but for the various reasons, including some that General Rubenstein mentioned about, about hiring out of the civilian community uh, that kept us from doing it? Do we have an adequate enough uh, internal process by which we can ensure in the future that, A, we, we understand where the growth is coming? There was talk about about Fort Campbell, for example, and B, we're in a position to make sure when that growth occurs, we've met the need. 
Yes, sir. That's precisely what I was attempting to explain uh, to the question from uh, Bob. Try Sonnen. again, and I'll listen I, even I more. Will, I'll be happy to, sir, because it, it bears repeating. Uh, the, the shortfall that we had was in, in linking the, the movement of assets, military and civilian, uh, in advance of predictable increases into the, the, the warrior transition unit. Now, we had, the, we had the understanding, but we were relying on a process that, as I mentioned in my earlier statement, simply wasn't nimble enough. We, th we thought it was, was sufficiently nimble that we could place assets, either local, from the local commander's assets or from the departmental level, to meet the growth. What, was that lack of nimbleness in part what we just talked about with General Cheeks and the Manning document issues, that kind of lack of? I think it is, sir, yes. Okay, All right, that's fair. And, and for both military and civilian going forward, you will see a much better, the, the, the committee will see a much better uh, synergistic relationship between the department, the uh, warrior transition unit, and the warrior transition office to predict what are the requirements going to be at Fort Campbell? How close can we come using modeling and sampling techniques to get at the, uh, the influx upon redeployment? And my goal is to position those assets before the soldiers arrive. So we're as nimble as we need be and as flexible as required now. Is that correct? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't. <laughs> we are as nimble and as flexible as we need be now. Going forward, not, I, I not believe so. I, I truly believe. Uh, I truly believe, Frago Three gives us no. the capability. First of all, it empowers the commander locally to repeat what General Cheek said. Uh, at try as we might, uh, there, there still were at the lowest levels commanders who were who felt, for whatever reason, hamstrung by the letter of the exord or the letter of uh, Frago One or Frago Two. But in point of fact, it was very clear that going back as far as April and even before April, that the Vice's intent was, and it was communicated quite clearly to me, fill it from the local assets, and we will, we will backfill. Frago 3 empowers commanders now to be able to do that without any, without any equivocation. From your lips to God's ears, General, I hope you're right. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair, I see my time's expired <laughs> again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Ms. Chair. Ms. Boyda. Help me understand when Frago 3, what was the timing? What is the timing on Frago 3? July. Uh, first, first of July, of July. The, uh, right before 4th of July weekend, I think, uh, 2nd of July when we issued that fragmentary order. Okay. When we, uh, we had the pleasure, the honor of going with uh, Mr. McHugh to Fort Drum, and one of the things that we heard consistently was I'm just sitting here waiting for my MEB. Again, it was just, there was one person, and I don't remember her name, but it was one doctor, and everybody was just sitting there waiting for this one person to sign their papers and get going. They'd been there for months. The two of them had pregnant wives. Uh, wives, of course, they thought that they were going to be back home, so the wives pregnant were back home. As you can well imagine, this was not a very good thing. Where, how are we doing on just getting the number of MEBs through? And the, I'm going with, it, with a different kind of a, the broader question here. I heard you say that suicides and other really horrible events were, were, were decreasing, and I think in and of itself, that's an honorable and worthy goal, and I'm glad to hear about that. Are we also looking at just the time that it used to take us through the um, through the med hold, med hold, whatever all those words were? Was there a time when, or do we have metrics for how long it used to take us? And are all of these is everything that we're doing actually moving the timetable up anymore? Do we have metrics before, after, and, and talk to me about MEBs, please? Ma'am, when I got to Eisenhower Medical Center in the mid -90, late 90s, uh, I had a soldier, MEB, a medical hold soldier who had been there for six and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have those kinds of issues anymore. Do we just, again, and I, I appreciate that anecdotes are interesting, 
Do we have set goals? Generally, where are we? Is this speeding this up for us? Is it, do we know that it's speeding it up? And do we, do you have a, do you have some metrics of where things were one and two years ago? How and what do you expect to yes. have this really? Using the, the MEB as your starting point for that question, we do have metrics. 90 days from the time a soldier is on profile until the MEB is in the mail to the next step, which is the PEB, the Physical Evaluation Board. So the MEB is at, done at the local hospital level mm -hmm. and then mailed to the PEB, which then defaults to General Shell's G1. 90 I'm actually days. I'm understanding all this now. It's <laughs> almost frightening. Uh, our metric is and has been 90 days. And uh, we can go back into the data files. I can take you back to Fort Drum in 2002 and tell you uh, what the numbers were, or 2006, or today, 2008. And we do track those very, very closely. The, the MEB physician at Fort Drum, uh, when she arrived, the, uh, the kickback rate, when the MEB goes to the PEB, the kickback rate was 40%. Uh, she and the command elected to go for quality of the MEB process, not speed. And uh, she was able to get the kickback rate down to 0% in April and May. Now, to do that, she had to learn her job. This is, this is um, as we heard earlier from the, the subcommittee, th this is uh, putting people into jobs that they've not done before. And this physician had not been an occupational health kind of MEB doc. You have to learn how to be an MEB doc. Uh, we've put a second physician at Fort Drum doing MEBs along with this, per this particular physician. We have... Uh, fired a contracted doctor who was working with her who was not doing a good job and uh, erased the backlog. Over 110 MEBs left or will have left Fort Drum by the end of this month, next Thursday, over 110. Let me just say again, too, that I, you know, I think that's, that's, I applaud that. What, what metrics do you have or something? I mean, I don't mind saying I was looking forward to going up to Fort Drum and being told that things were pretty, you know, w things were going well. And in fact, they, they are going well much of the time. But we had some really, some fundamental underlying problems. And what was a little concerning to me is, is it felt like that the subcommittee was the one who was saying to y'all, there's a real problem here and we're hearing about it in living color. And I want you to know that I hear about that same sort of thing. I've, I've just dealt with a uh, a mother who was, and father, but a mother who was absolutely beside herself with an extremely sick son, extremely sick son, who could not get into a WTU to save his life, and I mean that almost literally. And when we had to intervene to get that to happen, and this was this is something that should have been happening. What I'm looking for is where, I just want to know that you, that those are, somewhere or another, that you're following those metrics and you're able to pick those things out before we happen to show up at Fort Drum or Fort Wiley or whatever, wherever we show up and do a sensing session. And in, and in fact, we do track MEBs at every one of our hospitals and every one of our large clinics that do MEBs. We track it every month. We track the number of patients who have been there, 0 to 15, 16. Were you already then, and I am putting you on the spot, were you already then aware that, that this one woman who was, you know, doing the Lord's work there at Fort Drum was not able to keep up? Was that, were you already in process doing something about that or was our being there? No, ma'am. On uh, my email to your staff on the 20th of June, I expressed that, in fact, we were aware that Fort Drum was having a problem. The Fort Drum chain of command, the commander of the hospital and his staff, were working on a Lean Six Sigma, a quality improvement process, which is a process designed to, to implement change that is permanent mm -hmm. as opposed to fixing something very rapidly and it goes away. And so what I directed on the 20th of June was to put the Lean Six Sigma project on hold to go in and clean out the backlog and then to resume the Lean Six Sigma project to develop permanent change. Then we will learn the lessons from that permanent change that we can apply to our other 25 hospitals mm -hmm. and uh, remaining large clinics that do MEBs. We had an eye on it. We observe our MEBs across all 26 hospitals on a monthly basis. We let local commanders make efforts to fix their issues uh, as opposed to using a 2,000-mile screwdriver to fix it for them. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we did direct with a 2,000-mile screwdriver to wait to fix the backlog, and as I mentioned, 110 MEBs will leave post this month, and then to go back to the Lean Six Sigma project for mm -hmm. permanent change. 
And I appreciate your helping us with the visit too. So yes. thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I go to Ms. Hongas, I, if we were to go to a sensing session uh, today, at what base would you expect that we would hear the most complaints that perhaps they haven't been able to move through this sensing session or the uh, MEB process as, as swiftly as you've just been able to articulate? I, I couldn't answer that right now. I could get an answer to you, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Are you saying as far as uh, bases that have slow MEB rates or? Right, yeah. I, I can get uh, that for you. Well, I, and yes, ma'am. I, I Generally, what I could tell you is our installations where we have deploying units, uh, you know, a high number of brigade combat teams are where we have the greatest challenges in, uh, in, in our MEB timelines. The best one uh, is Fort, uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, where they consistently process theirs under 50 days, and they have none waiting over 90 days. So they, they do an excellent job. And one of the things that we will do this fall at our conference, we're going to bring in some of our best practices, Fort Bliss being one of them, and have them share just what it is that they're doing. And, and what I would just tell you is it's the, it's the cooperation across that installation. It's not all tied to medical processes, but it's the cooperation of unit commanders and others that make them so successful and, and a really superb uh, administrator that runs their program. So mm -hmm. we have some places where they're successful, and we've got to share that across the Army to try and improve everywhere. But those with dedicated people that uh, you know that you invest in to do that, you'll have success. Thank Madam you, Madam Chair. May, I, you, may I comment on that question? I'd like to, if I may, uh, I'd like to come back to uh, Ms. Boyda's uh, question about something fundamentally wrong. And I would I would offer two points. Uh, first of all, is a is a bright spot on the horizon. Uh, General Casey has asked retired General Fred Franks, uh, Desert Storm hero and uh, Vietnam era amputee uh, to, to lead a 90 day effort to blow into what General Casey refers to as the log jam of the MEB PEB process. And it is a log jam. Uh, General Rubenstein is absolutely correct. We monitor month by month across the entire Army where the Army stands against the, the Department of Defense standards uh, for timeliness of medical evaluation boards and physical evaluation boards. And I dare say across the entire Army, we are not meeting the standard. To my, to my critical point, though, to your question, ma'am, the fundamental problem is that the Medical Evaluation Board and the Physical Evaluation Board place the soldier and the service at, at <coughs> adversarial relationships. It shouldn't. It should not. But it does. And until we get the service out of the disability rating process, it's going to continue to be that way. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back, uh, perhaps, to that discussion. Ms. Angus? I have a question more about at the end of the cycle. As warriors are transitioning out, what percentage go back into regular service? Do you, do you know, as opposed to uh, leaving the services? Yes, ma'am. Uh, for this last month, it was 42 percent. Uh, historically, it's around 65 percent. And one of the reasons why we, we're seeing this drop right now is this, I think, is we're beginning to see this population of soldiers that were in the uh, medical evaluation board process that we moved into the warrior transition units. And, and our, traditionally, when you're in that process, oh, less than 10 percent will remain in the service when they, when they enter that process. So I believe we'll see that come back up to the 50, 60 percent, well, 65 percent range. But that's, that's where we are right now, 42 percent. And do you have in place a process for following those who get back out into uh, regular duty to sort of see how they're doing and to use the feedback, the data from their experiences to refine what you're doing in the transition units? Ma'am, I don't know that we do. That's a great idea, though, and I think it's something that we ought to, we ought to pursue. One of the things that we do want to do, um, for our soldiers returning to service, in fact, I was at Fort Bliss and a soldier who was returning to duty remarked to me that there were a lot of programs in the WTU to help soldiers that were leaving the service, but not a whole lot to help the soldiers that were staying. And leave it, leave it to a soldier to give you that blinding flash of the obvious. And so we, we and, and General Rochelle is uh, well involved with this uh, as well. We're going to put retention NCOs in our warrior transition units and build a program around them to, to retain a lot more of these soldiers uh, that, that are probably medically fit, maybe not in the original military specialty, but in another one. And, uh, and also have a rigorous program 
to assist them as they, they go back in. And when we work this up, one of the things we want to do is bring some of those soldiers in to talk to us and their chain of command so that they can help us build that system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Angus. Dr. Snyder. Help me understand, if you would, when a unit decides to put a person into the warrior transition unit, and I guess I'll address this to General Cheek, uh, is that a, uh, I assume that there's an orders cut and there's a formal transfer to that unit, is that correct? Yes, sir. In fact, uh, the way our, we, we've just revised that process in our current fragment order three that we've referred to many times. The, the commander in evaluation of the, of the soldier will make a record, and I'm talking about the unit commander, he will write a memorandum saying, I would like the soldier assigned to the warrior transition unit. And then there are several forms that will go with that, the chain of commands assessment and his medical provider's assessment as, as to his medical condition. That application will go to what we call the triad of leadership, the installation commander, the medical treatment facility commander, and WTU commander. And because we have such variation across the Army in size and scope of warrior transition units, that triad of leadership will determine what process they'll use to re review that, I'll call it application, and that, that system that they design will make the decision whether to allow that soldier in or not. And then that person is formally assigned to that unit? Yes, sir. There, there are for some instances where we'll attach, but uh, yes, assign them to the unit. For those that are, uh, let me put it another way, does that mean that for some of them then they actually have to pack up their bags and move to a different barracks, living quarters? Yes, sir. It's a, it's a, it's a move. Um, you had talked before about the, you know, you, you, you seem to be as adverse to this idea of a waiting list as probably we are, but as you have looked at the 12,000 plus people that are there now, and uh, do you look at some of them and say at this point, some of those should have stayed with their unit. I don't know if the, sh the blown out shoulder from weightlifting or is a good example or uh, yes, sir. are there some people that, that should have, that you say you're looking at your universe of these numbers are going up, or you're looking at some of those and saying, and I may have missed this in early testimony, that, they, that, that these people really were not the kind of folks the warrior transition unit was set up for. We want them to have good care, but they could have been staying on sick call, put on light duty, sitting in the office helping someone uh, while they've got their ankle propped up or mm -hmm. still keeping all their appointments. Uh, wh wh where are you all at with that evaluation? And, and sir, the, when I go out and visit warrior transition units, that's exactly the question I will ask, uh, especially the cadre, not so much the, the soldiers themselves. And the response I get is typically between 10 and 30 percent they feel, the cadre feels, don't need the managed care that we have in a, in a warrior transition unit. So I believe the answer to your question is yes, we have some that they're probably all benefiting from, from that focused healing environment, but some of them would do perhaps just as well uh, in their units in the way we've done this in the past. So, so 10 to 30 percent is a high number. Yes, sir. When you're talking and, about 12,000, you're talking up to 3,500, 4,000 people that yes, sir. may not be, that would solve some of your manning issues. Well, it would, sir. And one, one thing, too, we're, we want to be very careful about how we proceed on this because no, one of the things we don't want to do is have our soldiers think that we're going to take the ax out and chop a bunch of folks out of the unit. It just means they could get lost again. Yes, sir. We're going to be real careful. And what we've told the commanders is based on the recommendation of the triad of care, that primary care physician, nurse case manager, and squad leader, in consultation with a soldier, we'll look to make a recommendation to move him on. Of the people, of the, the 12,000 that are currently in the warrior transition unit, how many of them uh, during the day are going to a duty station and performing some kind of work, duty, yes, sir. Or in line with their MOS? Uh, depending on the capabilities of the soldier, we mandate that they be enrolled in some kind of work or education program. And we're probably at about 75 percent. There's probably some more that we can add to that. But a great many of the soldiers will go either on the installation and, and work or back to their, their uh, parent unit that they came from and, and do work. And we have a variety of other things that they do. And some take college courses and other things like that. But we want them as part of our comprehensive transition plan, we want to have a plan for them to develop or, or to improve medically and heal, but also personally and, and as well as professionally. And so we want to make this a, a very strong environment that prepares them for that transition back to the Army or as a, a veteran in the, in the civilian community. 
General Michelle, my, my last question is, what, uh, when would be the recommended time if you were sitting here for this subcommittee to hold another hearing like this with you all to hear about how we're doing? Three weeks after you retire, or <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir, I I, uh, I know again. I, I've reviewed the uh, the testimony on the, the four previous hearings, uh, all the way back to uh, General Schoolmaker, Chief of Staff, on this particular subject, and and I know that somewhere along the way we we declared uh, very intentionally and and well intentioned. Uh, true full operational capability and we were in the spirit and the spirit of uh, uh, the AMAP but we didn't know in many cases what we didn't know and I, I'm referring to the bureaucracy at the lower levels and the bureaucracy at the higher levels uh, the special duty assignment pay as an example in my humble opinion I think we will be uh, between October and January we will no kidding be full up and running as we have testified. Uh, it takes time to kill bureaucracies. Uh, it takes time to make sure that in, the, in an organization as large as the Army, stretched as much as the Army is and, and moving in as many different directions as the Army is to, uh, to have something of this novel nature really operating the way we fully intended it to. So, sir, uh, respectfully, my uh, my answer to your question is between October and January yeah. of 09. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. Uh, and we certainly appreciate all of all of your responses. And, and we know that uh, this is very important to you. It's obviously very important to our soldiers and their families. And I think, if anything, we came away from the Fort Drum experience, feeling sensing session there, feeling that we needed to do better. Um, by all of those, <laughs> that it was important to do that. You mentioned, I think, General Cheek, the focused healing environment. And I went with the expectation that we would see that focused healing environment. Perhaps that was unrealistic. But I think that it was also frustrating to get the sense that people were sitting around at a level of boredom, uh, and anxiety, uh, not feeling that things were happening for them. And one of the concerns that we heard, and, and we went to Fort Drum partly to see how the community and the military facilities work together. And I know as the staff has gone around to other facilities, to other bases, there seemed to be certainly a willingness, and you mentioned, uh, I think General Rubenstein, you know, the, the uh, aggressive nature of trying to get appointments uh, for soldiers downtown, wherever that might be, where there is um, uh, other um, mental health providers, other providers who are there in the community. And yet we're also hearing, the staff is hearing that there's kind of reluctance on the part of the commanders in some cases to open up the, those opportunities, that they're having a hard time getting those appointments. And we certainly heard that at Fort Drum. They were waiting a long time. We acknowledged that uh, they didn't have the providers they wanted either. There, a new clinic was opening up. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, how you see that changing uh, at all, that people are able to get the appointments that they need. That's, you know, no matter how many cadre you have, even uh, with a low ratio, if the appointments aren't coming through, then that's gonna be difficult for everyone to move that situation forward. The other question I would have is just about the standards um, by which people are asked to see uh, soldiers, whether the time frame, is it 30 minutes, is it 45 minutes? an hour, uh, what kind, what do we know about the appointments that are being made and the level of care in which they're being provided, the level of expertise, uh, so that people can move from one point to another. It's fine if people are getting their appointments, but if nothing's happening in those appointments, then that's, you know, not so helpful. So uh, to your first question, uh, the, the availability or the uh, reluctance on the part of commanders to send patients downtown, whether they are active duty in, in the WTU or not. Uh, there is no uh, corporate, there's no organizational bias about sending patients downtown. Wherever you need to send a patient to receive care is where we send a patient to receive care. Fort Drum in particular, in October of last year, uh, we sent uh, 380 patients downtown in uh, April of this year. 
six months later, uh, over 500, almost 550 went downtown. So there's, it, it's a growing trend to send provide, uh, patients downtown if that's where the care is available for them. As far as the type of appointments, uh, we run a variety types of types of appointments from an initial appointment to a family practice doc to a psychiatric uh, appointment with a psychologist or a psychiatric appointment with a psychiatrist. They're all of different lengths. The length of the appointment is appropriate to the needs of the patient. Now, that's from the perspective of our healthcare providers. Not all patients think they get enough time when they see their doctor. That's true in the military. That's true in the civilian sector. Um, the literature is replete with the patients who walk in with the latest advertisement for the drug or the application or the treatment, uh, which they've read about, which may or may not be appropriate for them. The same is true with getting the, the amount of time you think you need to get with your provider. Um, is there anyone who oversees that care so that there's some opportunity to uh, talk professionally even about um, what people are seeing, what kind of resources they're accessing? I'm just wondering, is there anyone who organizes that to the extent that you're able to get the best utilization, the best professional care, and that there's some you know, there's dialogue about that, that there's some inter interface. There are actually a variety of, of mechanisms to do just that. Uh, within the WTU itself, you have the nurse case manager, the supervisory nurse case manager, the uh, primary care provider, the squad leader, that triad with the supervisory nurse case manager looking at cases, discussing cases. If it's a small, like Fort Leavenworth, where there are 19 warriors in transition, or a large WTU like uh, Fort Hood with over 1,300. So they are among themselves at the WTU level, they're discussing the needs of their patients. Um, additionally, within the hospital or clinic, um, we've got the deputy commander for clinical service and the deputy commander for nursing who are talking among themselves, a variety of committees that all hospitals are required to have to meet uh, joint commission accreditation, which all of our hospitals do. And so there are a variety of um, committees and work groups and in the case of the WTU, the, the triad of care, who are constantly talking about the health care needs of their patients. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because I think that sometimes we assume that that's happening and I want to be sure that the oversight is there so that we know that it is and that people are having the adequate kind of consultation time that's really required. Sure. Earlier we talked, you, you, very briefly in my time is up, but I wanted to just uh, clarify. You talked about the one-year authority for, hire, for hiring uh, that you have actually in the, re, in the uh, authorization bill, it's up to three years. Yes, ma'am, in the so that, NDAA yeah, 08. We're NDAA's. just waiting for department uh, implementation of that. Okay, good. So yes. we're, we're hoping that you can go forward with that anticipation. As are so. we. Thank you okay, very much. Great. Thank you. Mr. McHugh? Uh, I mentioned earlier I was happy when General Cheek said they were going to have a video teleconference and, and talk about the uh, the changes with respect to HRC and the Manning documents and uh, perhaps I should make a suggestion for a second topic in that um, what what our staff had heard repeatedly is that as as folks within the WTUs went through their their MEBs um, they might find themselves in a circumstance where there was a tag on for whatever reason, for a psychiatric evaluation. That psychiatric evaluation, of course, takes time. And in the process of going through that, uh, some of the, uh, the prior uh, findings, including the physical exams that were used to validate those findings, had expired and, and had to be redone. Now, that was addressed in the 07 implementation document in that, uh, as I read it, um, the commanders were <coughs> given the authority to waive that expiration in in a case needs basis. But apparently that's either been forgotten or they need to be, uh, have a booster shot as to be reminded of their authority there because we're still hearing, General, from people within the WTU that they're encounter encountering that kind of frustration where they're almost through in a, in a uh, psychiatric exam will expire some of their previous phys uh, physical exams. So maybe you could yes, sir, I'll, remind I'll take that. them of that so that we could get through there because I, I think it's another example of, of this guest disconnect where a problem was recognized to your yes, level sir. 
the authorities were implemented or documented out to circumvent it, and for whatever reason, the problem still couldn't. We'll exist. touch every one Trip. of our MEB facilities in the next few days Great. and pulse that, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, under under the topic of unintended consequences, a, a couple of things that I think we ought to be concerned about uh, and and try to avoid a hearing in the future where we talk about these problems that are re could result out of out of our very laudable and necessary and ongoing efforts for the WTU. And I'll, I'll use two examples. We have heard anecdotally <clears throat> where in an effort to meet the nursing shortages that go back to what you were talking about, General, uh, about the, re the, re the uh, recruiting problems of nursing across the country, uh, reassignments are happening within the, within the uh, military health care units on the facilities, moving nurses, military nurses, over to the WTUs to meet that need. We are hearing anecdotally, for example, at Fort Hood, where up to 50 percent of the military nurses have been assigned from the base's uh, medical facility to the WTU, and the result is you're having to take another look at perhaps closing some beds because now in, uh, you don't have the necessary nursing cadre at the facility. I don't know if you're probably not in a position to comment on that specifically, but we sure don't want to see a cannibalization of necessary personnel into the WTUs, and that's all we've talked about here today. I mean, I think we've made it pretty clear we want to see those ratios met, and I know you do too but where we create another problem somewhere else. In, in fact, I can speak to that. I talked okay, with Colonel let me, let me just give the other example so maybe you can handle them both okay. at once. But uh, just the, the other thing that, that concerns me, and General Cheeks, you, you commented about, that's the way we used to handle folks who had a medical challenge, non-combat related, that was, shall we say, less serious. Mm -hmm. We created medical holds for the distinct purpose of getting folks who had a need for time of recovery uh, with the good intention of getting out of those base units because apparently there was a lot of pressure to suck it up by the, by the unit commander, suck it up and get out there. And you all know uh, that, that phenomenon. The WTUs came as a follow-on to the medical hold circumstance for a lot of different reasons, but that well-intended effort to create the medical hold still exists. So are we taking a step backwards when we pull these folks out who were not hurt uh, on, in, a, in a combat, theater of combat, and weren't more, uh, more serious but do have medical challenges? I, I just worry about, you know, uh, back to the future. I'll start and I'll pass okay. off to, to General Cheek. Uh, I talked with Colonel Casper Jones, the commander of the Fort Hood Hospital, Darnell Army Medical Center on uh, Saturday. Uh, he told me on Saturday that if he moved patient, uh, if he moves nurses from his hospital to the WTU, he would break the hospital. And I told him not to do that. Uh, that uh, that uh, given the fact that of his 1,300 soldiers in the WTU, 166 are actually on leave, just uh, ready to depart the unit and go to the next assignment. Or um, and uh, given the fact that they've got things well in hand, I told him not to move and break the hospital itself. Um, so that, that's the answer to the, the first question. Th that's an example. I want to make sure that we're not somewhere else where perhaps the commander isn't. We, we directed all 26 hospital commanders to look at the, the potential of moving, and I'm going to speak to the medical side, yeah. uh, not the, the staff squad leaders and such. We directed all 26 hospital commanders to look at their hospital, to move where they could, but not to break anything in the process. In, the, in getting ready for tomorrow's VTC with General Cody, uh, yesterday and today, each of the hospitals have briefed the MedCom headquarters on what they did over the weekend, uh, what, what uh, risk they may have taken with their hospital, or where they made a decision not to move someone to the WTU because of the negative consequences, the, the second order effect that you very rightly bring up. Thank you. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Um, sir, I would just say I think that's a valid concern. Uh, and for the soldiers that remain in their unit to rehabilitate, we're going to have to keep a, a close eye on them. But I would tell you, frankly, we have quite a number of those soldiers right now in the Army all around our units that are doing very well and, and re rehabilitating from things like we said, like a, a, a you know torn cartilage in the knee or a shoulder injury. 
Um, we actually, in looking at this FRAGO, considered an enrollment program where we would sort of, we would enroll soldiers that remain in their units and track them and give them some priority. And, and actually, in concert with, in discussions with your staffers as well as the SASC and our commanders, they all really said, hey, not so fast and really hold off on that. So we've tabled that for now. We'll keep it in consideration if we see a, an, an issue uh, with it. But I do think the medical hold, uh, that's a really a different category of soldier. Those really matched closer to a really severely injured uh, soldiers rather than what we're talking about of a more routine nature. So the, the, to some degree, in fact, as a commander, what I would tell you as an operational commander, I couldn't figure out how to get a guy into medical hold. It was too hard, I mean, literally. So we, we just took care of the, those soldiers under their leadership. And, and I think that is important as well, that the Army's leaders be responsible for their soldiers, both personally, professionally, and, and medically, if necessary, to get them to their, the proper care. But we will watch that, and if we have bad consequences, then we'll look to how we can we can improve that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. A couple more questions, uh, and I again I appreciate the the opportunity to keep going around on here, and you guys have been extremely patient, and I I really appreciate your answers. Um, let's talk Milcon here. We've got some real Milcon struggles, and from what I understand. Um, we still are looking forward to what the whole military construction is going to need to look like. And it's my understanding that when we ask for a list for this particular hearing, that the comptroller of the DOD said, no, we're not able to give that to you, or we're not we're not going to give that to you, or we don't, do we have, does this committee or does our military construction committee, subcommittee, have an idea of what has to be done Clearly the one that pops up is Fort Carson, that in fact, you know, we're just asking for a highly improbable slash impossible to be done there, and yet we don't see what's, where we're headed with Milcon. Can you address that, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. General Wilson, I'll, I'll be glad to address that. I, I think uh, from the beginning, you know kind of where we started uh, with our uh, uh, modifying our existing facilities. And with the Congress's help, $100 million, mm -hmm. I think $162 million in 07 mm -hmm. and then $100 million in 08, we've been able to almost complete that. And that's taking 35 WTUs, combination of the three type facilities, and modifying the existing ones to accommodate our warriors in transition. Uh, that was an intermediate step. Mm -hmm. What we need is, uh, is our uh, permanent construction dollars to create this campus-like environment and place those uh, where they need to be close to a medical facility. Did I misunderstand something? And I, I really, it would be highly possible that I did. Did I misunderstand that, do we, does this committee have your projected needs for MILCON through whatever the FI dip is here? I, no, I, you do not have that. I, I submitted that, uh, the Army submitted that to OSD, a request for supplemental funds it's, it's down from the initial $1.4 billion we looked at. Uh, we've kind of sized that on what we think the 21 uh, new construction for permanent facilities should be. Uh, the, amount of, the dollar amount for that is um, $981 million, and we've submitted those 21 uh, uh, installations to OSD, and, and I would be glad to give that to... Uh, Chairman Edwards and his committee, or if you'd like, uh, but we have some of that OSD, and, and they're looking at that, and we're working together to. Uh, and with again, at Fort Riley, where I represent, things yes. you know we're moving along in that direction, and uh, it's it's been a huge benefit, and everybody is very happy. But we're still so if you could if you could help us just get that, so we don't we're making sure that we're pretty even, and nothing will always be completely even, but we just want to make sure we understand where we're going with regard to that. And then the final question that I have uh, just comes back to the retention of as many of these soldiers in, in, into our military. And a question that I get, just I've had it a couple of times from people in my district, and these are not military, um, they would be a military family grandma, generally something like that. What, would, what am I supposed to say to them when they say, why don't, are we training our young men who are suffering from some PTSD 
to bring them back in as people who are uh, would be trained in the PTSD and stay in the military. Uh, realistically, how much of that are we able to accomplish? How much of that's going to be a good thing? I don't want to oversell it. If it's not a great thing, I, I want to tell people. But I've actually gotten that question twice. And I'd like to know how we do that. And then is there a disconnect between veterans who have come back or, or active duty that have come back from OEF and OIF versus somebody who tore his cartilage? Does everybody have the same opportunity to stay in the military and serve their country, or is there any general? If you could just talk about what retention, how we, how do we aggressively, are we asking people to do that? Are we kind of our our number one goal for every wounded warrior is to allow him or her to return to active duty, and uh, I gave some examples earlier of soldiers who were in combat. Mm -hmm. Soldiers who are jumping out of airplanes who are, uh, and there are many, many other examples of soldiers who uh, are staying on active duty with uh, injuries that heretofore would have just blanket have sent them home. And does, is, is there, does every, uh, does every soldier get treated pretty similarly in that regard or is there any preference given or is it just, and I have a reason for asking that but I won't go into it, but is there, Generally, is there any differentiation between soldiers on how they're encouraged to stay in, or is, are those they they're looking they're all out there looking for new MOSs if that's necessary? Uh, no, th there is there is no differentiation uh, from a corporate from an organizational perspective. If a soldier has an injury and wants to stay in the service, we're going to find a way to the best of our abilities to to work it for that soldier to stay in the service. It may require a change in career fields. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not. Uh, it, may, um, it may take a long time to rehabilitate that soldier to allow them to return to duty. It may be a type of injury which happens very quickly. They may have been injured in combat. They may have been injured here in the United States, have never been de uh, deployed before. Mm -hmm. But in every regard, we're going to give the soldier the yeah. benefit of the doubt. Thank you for clarifying that. What about the PTSD uh, and and bringing those m men and women who I can I can imagine that would be fraught with some real benefits and some real challenges. Well, How do you balance that? We out? owe it to that soldier to work with them and work them through and treat them for their PTSD for for the, that percent that do have PTSD. And I'm talking about to go in that these soldiers to go into the care of other soldiers with PTSD. That's the uh, question I've been asked a couple of times. To put soldiers in the care of other soldiers the, in the warrior transition unit? A soldier unit? who is, has PTSD, to go back and spend the time to train that soldier in their, to send them to college, whatever, to, to come out two, three, four years later as somebody who is a, you know, has a licensed social worker or whatever with mm. PTSD. Do we ever do that? Do we I, encourage I don't them? know that we don't do that. But uh, you're asking for a specific example or, or anecdote. Uh, I, I don't the know that we. The first time I got it, I didn't have a really good answer. The second yeah. time I said, I'll find out. But we, but we, we, we do send soldiers uh, through our long term health education and training program, all for graduate degree, uh, especially in the, the health care fields. We do send folks out for training and for further education. There's an opportunity to use education and training uh, through the GI Bill and such. Uh, PTSD in and of itself is not a disqualifying factor if we have the PTSD under control. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's no reason we wouldn't keep a soldier who is responding well and uh, has PTSD under control, uh, keep that soldier in the Army in, in whatever capacity he or she's able to serve. All right. I think I'm actually finished with my questions, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. Congresswoman, yes. if I may close out with you on your specific question of Fort Riley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That those projects for Fort Riley were in the OH Oh, we're good on now. Riley. No, I'm not worried about Riley. So you're, they're coming. Yes. It's a good news story for Fort, Fort Riley. It's just, again, I, as I understand, Fort Carson is the one who's, we're not, what is that on schedule? Is it, uh, and is it, are we still, uh, is, where do we stand with that specifically? There were some temporary buildings that I think are, are scheduled. Exactly. Some contracting problems. Yeah, you know, Fort Fort Carson, the billets and the uh, 
uh, battalion headquarters and company headquarters are in our 09 supplemental request for those facilities. But we, we, we need permanent facilities. We're in temporary facilities now. Mm -hmm. Permit solution is has not been. Uh, it's going to go forward with the 09 supplemental. We hope. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate you. Thank you, Miss Boyda. Thank you for hanging in there uh, through the course of the last two hours, and we'll 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 conclude it in just a second. I wanted to just mention because as part of the defense authorization, we did include language that would incentivize us to capture essentially um, those um, men and women who have perhaps suffered from PTSD or not, who would like to go into mental health provider fields to be able to really help out um, their peers. And that's something that, you know, the language is there and how exactly it's done, I think will we'll proceed over a period of time. But I do want to recognize that the first School of Social Work um, for the Army, right, uh, was just begun this month. And so we're hoping that we will have a number of people who perhaps couldn't move on with their prior fields, but that they, they recognize how important it is to move on and to help their fellow soldiers. And we hope that they would be interested in those fields, having had a firsthand knowledge uh, of how that can be affected during wartime. So, Thank you very much. So we will be doing that, and uh, I'm very pleased that, that we're going to move on to it. One question to just follow up with the um, military construction issue for a second. About what size um, WTO, WTU population will those MILCON projects support that you describe support? How do they jive with the population that we are seeing? That, that popula I think that, that MILCON was based on uh, moving to the uh, 12,000. We still have some work to do to go to, to the 16,000 or greater. Um, and we're working that we just, for example, I just got a request in from Fort Hood last Friday for additional uh, military construction requirements. So we're still, we're still working the growth. We've, uh, we've executed our requirements based on the current population we have with 100% growth over the last year, and that's what's forward to OSD at this time. And, and sir, if I can add, add to that, uh, that, that's true, but the, that also assumes a, a significant, well, about half of the population would be married and living off post. So we're not building 12,000, you know, barracks for 12,000 soldiers, but it, it reflects the demographics of our Army population. We, we look at 30 percent, basically, of the population that would need facility support, and that's what we base that on. As we continue to provide oversight on this issue and to move forward, will we be provided by a list of all those requirements that you have? We can certainly provide that to you. Well, we would try and send that signal that we think is appropriate, um, that we have an opportunity to do that so that we can continue to work closely with you on that issue. I know the, uh, the concern of when, when you might come back and have an opportunity to, to look at these issues again. One of the difficulties, of course, that we're dealing with is there is a, a congressional recess that's coming up um, by the end of September. And I'm wondering whether you feel that you know, there would be uh, sufficient um, movement by even September to take a look at, at some of these issues and see if we're you know, pretty much on track with where you'd like to be and if there's any way that we can be of further help. Is September too soon? My estimate would be September would be too soon. Uh, I don't believe that we would have significant movement, to use your term, uh, neither in terms of, of personnel uh, nor in terms of facilities uh, to show an appreciable, an appreciable change worthy of a hearing. And, and ma'am, I'll be glad to provide updates as we move along uh, mm -hmm. to the, to, to, to your staffers. I mean, I think that we've got a pretty strong relationship that we can continue to update them and share information. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly commit to do likewise. Uh, and I'd like to just commend uh, the staff on the, on the tremendous work and passion. Uh, it's, it's noteworthy. And the, um, it should be noted that there is movement every day. Uh, on Friday of last week, we had a job fair down in Round Rock, which is a small town just north of Austin, Texas. Um, we walked away from that 12-hour uh, that job fair with 15 job applications for nurses for Fort Hood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is movement every day. And what you see today is not what you would have seen uh, three weeks ago or three months ago. Is there anything else that you would like to say 
um, to the committee today to encourage us to um, help out in, in, in some other way, whether it's in with the bu bureaucratic um, problems that, that you've encountered or in any other way. Is there anything that you'd like to say that perhaps didn't get said? Well, clearly, only, only that, and I won't try to speak for everyone, but uh, we hope that we have communicated that, that we are absolutely committed to getting this right. Uh, we did overwhelm ourselves a little bit. Uh, we are on track, uh, and I'm committed and, and truly believe that FRAG 03 points us in the right direction. It unencumbers the local commander, it, it empowers him or her, and it also gives very clear standards to each of us on, on how we're going to take care of our most vulnerable, our wounded warriors. We're committed to doing that. Thank you. I, I, would, um, I would highlight the relationship that we have built over time with uh, Mr. Kildee and Ms. James. Uh, the openness of this committee and the openness of your staffers to come back to those of us who are working so hard to put the right programs and processes in place is amazing. And that openness allows us to continue the work in between these opportunities to talk with the, co the full committee. We appreciate that opportunity. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And look forward to working with you and uh, appreciate the support that you and your staff have given us. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we greatly appreciate your testimony today. Thank you for thanking our staff. We appreciate them as well. <laughs> and uh, we'll look forward to the next opportunity that we have. Thank you very much.